We'll call the meeting to order. Uh, we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance and invite you to join us. Roll call. Gary. Here. Grinberg. Here. Pepcorn. Here. Strand. Here. Mahoney. Here. Health. Streets Alive will take place August 25th from noon to 5 in downtown Fargo Moorhead. A fun open street festival encourages people in the community to live an active life filled with biking, running, inline skating, and other human powered uh, movement. Tony, you're going to bring a motorcycle down? Or <laughs> Tony knows how to ride a motorcycle in hail and rain, so it's uh, great to have you back. <laughs> Library, the library's kindergarten success story time series for the fall starts Saturday at the main library with a session titled Let's Love Books. The library staff will have a book bike at Trollwood Park on Tuesday and at Red River Market on August 24th. More community engagement dates for the book bike are scheduled in September and October. It's a great idea. You can pick up a book and uh, they have a lot of different types of books. Uh, some good news, the American League Central Plains Regional Tournament this past weekend in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Fargo Post 2 earned a dramatic victory in the second championship game and qualified for the American Legion World Series for the first time since 1992. The World Series will be played starting August 15th in Shelby, North Carolina. Post 2 is making its fourth appearance in the World Series with previous trips in 69, 89, and 92. We wish him best of luck. Matt bus driver Marv Mickelson was recently profiled in the forum, and I wanted to take the time to, sh to share a bit about Marv. This month he will be celebrating his 30th anniversary of driving a bus on the streets of Fargo. During this time, he has never caused an accident and has only missed four days of work. In addition to being a very safe driver, he's a true customer service gem for Matt Bus and the entire community. Congratulations to Marv and his wife, Chris. That's a great driving record, by the way. I hope my son uh, does the same. We work for you. As many of you know, our regionalization efforts have been a resounding success, especially in the area of providing drinking water for our metro. Tonight, our next uh, We Work For You series takes you to behind the scenes tour of the Fargo Water Treatment Plant operations. Enjoy it, please. <laughs> The water department, what we do is provide drinking water to the city of Fargo and regional customer and we need to provide that both from a safe water that meets EPA standards and we also need to provide that in, in enough supplies from fire protection and emergency storage so we have ample water supply both in quality and quantity. We do a lot of lab analysis. We have some pretty sophisticated instrumentation in our environmental labs. The nice part about it, we can see results say next day or same day that most utilities would take them a couple weeks. They'd have to send it into a national lab say in California or something and then they'd get the results and we, we see them uh, very quickly and then we can adjust our water operation accordingly. Scientists here, well, there are four of us at the plant and we just test the water every day to make sure that it's safe for consumption and we give our information to the water plant so that they can make any adjustments to keep the plant flowing smoothly. Out in the lab they can test for different metals and they can test for water hardness and total organic carbon, a variety of different testing out there. So things like calcium, magnesium are big contributors to hardness. This is a brand new instrument we just, we just got. It's a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. It's a pretty complicated instrument that since geosmin it's actually a really volatile molecule. If we had a standard of it you could take it and you could smell it. If the gas chromatograph that can actually detect what you're smelling or tasting there. We can see on a screen and quantify how much geosmin is actually in there. As far as our operators, we are staffed 24-7, 365, so we see what our water quality is at all times. The city uses water and we take in water from two sources here at the plant. With the existing plant, we use lime to soften the water. So you can't necessarily see hardness. The only thing that you would see is if your water was hard, you would see like white 
kind of deposits after your dishes dry or like your car dries. So we try to prevent that and soften. So these are our softening basins. Water is coming from our pretreatment area where we add a coagulant. We try to settle out all the suspended solids. When it comes into the softening area, this is where we try to remove all the hardness. This is the membrane treatment plan. The raw water comes into pretreatment. We add a coagulant. We try to get all those suspended solids to settle out. After it goes through pretreatment, it comes to our UF membranes, which stands for ultra filtration, like a fiber spaghetti noodle, I guess. And there's millions of these fibers on one module. Inside, this is where those cassettes full of those fibers are submerged. And then there's a channel basically right underneath where I'm standing that will feed each UF or ultra filtration train. Submerged under here is three cassettes. We pull suction with a pump. All the suspended solids gets rejected by the membrane and the clean filtrate water makes it through the fiber, and at this point, all the suspended solids and things that can get us sick are all rejected. So then after it goes through UF, then it goes into our filtrate basin and our filtrate pumps will push it through the RO skids. RO essentially removes everything. All the minerals, all the dissolved solids, all the minerals, plus any turbidity that would be left. Reverse osmosis removes all of that. That's kind of the last stage of the plant. This is still very new, but we're all learning and getting the hang of it. I see the future of our operation being information. We want to both monitor the quality of our processes, how they're doing. As we move into the future, we just continue this kind of improvement to our system. Just the level of effort that our, I think our utility staff puts in. They do projects, on day-to-day projects or in their operations. They really take great pride in being financially responsible and doing the right thing. Great operation, good job. Is there a motion to approve the order of agenda? Let's so move. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the July 29th, 2019 regular meeting? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carried. <coughs> consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve a consent agenda items one through 33? So moved. There a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, no discussion. Roll call, please. Greenberg? Aye. Strand? Yes. Gary? Yes. Pepcorn? Aye. Mahoney? Aye. Item number one, request from the police department requesting the city attorney prepare amendments to the Fargo Municipal Code relating to marijuana and marijuana paraphernalia, bringing it into alignment with the state law. A uh, way requirement to receive and file ordinance one week prior to first reading and first reading the ordinance relating to marijuana and marijuana paraphernalia. I think Eric Johnson and, oh, I'm sorry, Chief Todd and? William Wisher. I'm the assistant uh, city attorney doing most of the prosecution work for the city. Oh, welcome. Welcome aboard. So who wants to go first? Chief. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, uh, city attorney's office has been working with us on uh, so a couple of amendments to city ordinance to reflect changes that were made in state law regarding marijuana and paraphernalia. Uh, in the bullet points on my memo, you can see some of the results of those changes. Uh, these changes have to be made because we can't supersede state laws, if, if I'm correct. And uh, uh, Will has done a lot of the work here in, in making the changes. And the amend or the, the motion is asking you to. Uh, approve uh, going forward and waiving the requirement of receipt and filing of said ordinances one week prior to first reading and that this be the first reading. Any other comments on it? Nothing further if any of the commissioners have any questions so I'm free to answer them. So if you pick up somebody now what happened? Right now if uh, we pick if we picked somebody up we would just refer them to district court instead of municipal court uh, and apply the, the state law to that instead of the city ordinance until the change gets made. Questions of the chief or the attorneys? Commissioner Grinberg? Any other comments or how this law changes impacted your day-to-day -day activities in the Fargo Police Department? Um, I don't think it'll have a big effect uh, on, on 
on the way we do business. Uh, I think you might see more of the effect uh, in the in the com criminal justice system, the courts, and prosecution. Do I have a motion? Move for approval. Second. We've been seconded in a further discussion. Roll call vote, please. Grinberg? Aye. Gehrig? Yes. Pepcorn? Aye. Strand? Yes. Mahoney? Aye. We're ready for public hearings, but I think we have to wait a few minutes so we can go to item 36. Uh, I think Scott's here again. Request for approval of guaranteeing maximum price of $1,499,848 and an amendment to the contract from the Glug McGug uh, Trust, uh, Construction Company uh, for Construction Management Service, Civic Plaza, Area 1. Nicole Crutchfield to explain. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, so here we are with the last step of the first phase of construction for the Civic Plaza. You've heard us, uh, Mr. Bishop with BLD in front of you several times talking about the design process and how we got to this point. Of course, we're happy to answer any questions uh, along those lines. But meanwhile, I'm going to introduce uh, Scott. He's here to um, talk about um, this last stage in the project, um, which would be in front of you tonight, the guaranteed maximum price for building this first phase of construction. So um, with that, I'll introduce Scott. And I should mention, uh, we do have McCoff Construction present if you have any questions. Uh, hello, commissioners and mayor and Mr. Mayor. Good to see you all again here today. <clears throat> um, this is a brief presentation. Uh, you've seen a lot of the design drawings previously, and uh, what this is really about is uh, making sure that we can get Sodbuster in place. This is the critical step where you guys approve um, <clears throat> approve this project to move forward into construction and the dollar amount that we had discussed previously. Uh, we've been working with McGuff uh, through this process of establishing the guaranteed maximum price, which they did so with our 100% design development drawings. Um, that uh, includes exactly what you see here. So basically what we got um, for uh, the budget of, of uh, what has been explained approximately $1.5 million is the project that we drew up and talked about last time I was here. So that, that is the good news, uh, which means uh, all of these various elements, uh, the paving, uh, the brick outline, the crack old pattern in the, in the paving, as well as the viewing platforms, the benches, uh, lighting, and the beautiful plantings that surround the sod buster. Uh, and so all of this, again, um, is for, as is stated in the GMP at 1.499, uh, we have a, a couple of, um, $16 that we're under, so that's, uh, that's good. We'll, look, we'll put that in the savings. The area, uh, again, is approximately 25,000 square feet, uh, and that is a cost of about $59 a square foot, just so you understand. That was uh, what we had estimated in our price range when we first uh, brought this project. So we're happy that this landed where it did. It doesn't, that's not always the way that it goes, um, but uh, this, that means that we're, we're targeted to move forward uh, with your approval. Just Scott, give, that's within the time frame you talked about with McGuff, aren't they building some other building in town? They are, um, but yes, that, that is within the time frame uh, that we've, we've talked about now. Keep in mind that time frame depends on a lot of things, but we are we are committed to making sure that we can get Sodbuster in place before the year is over, um, and we'd like to get it in place before the snow flies, and we'd like to get it in place before um, before the weather turns. So all of those are still our goals, uh, and that is how we've looked at the, this particular schedule. So you can see um, the construction current construction manager schedule for this work <laughs> upon approval. Um, gets us to uh, hopefully that install at the end of September, and then we would look uh, for a week or two outside of that to actually have a dedication ceremony. Uh, again, things can happen on construction sites, but right now this is the plan, and we, we believe that we can move forward with it with, for what we know. Uh, and then just to give you a broader perspective of the schedule, so we're still working, of course, on the overall um, uh, idea of what the concept for the entire plaza will be and this is actually a great project to showcase some of those materials and techniques that we'll be using so we see this as a really great opportunity to demonstrate some of those things and start to show people 
really what this project is all about in the long run. As well, um, we will be obviously working through construction over the next six weeks in order to get things squared away. Um, and you will see me often to make sure that that is, uh, is going according to schedule. Um, so we will continue that work as well as the um, concept design for the rest of the plaza. Um, and so just to give you a broader scheme, and, and this is just how we start to frame this large project, the total project schedule for all things plaza and bridge and surrounding street projects, uh, really for 2019 through 2020. Uh, and so you can see with this particular image how this project fits into the overall. Uh, this is obviously subject to different approvals and changes, but I want you to know that we're still focused on making sure that we deliver the Civic Plaza as a whole uh, sometime within the, the near and relevant future. Uh, so uh, at that point, I will put it up for any questions you all have, hopefully that I can field. Any questions, Commissioner, Commissioner Pippen? Mr. Chairman, and so can you talk a little bit about for the short term, that parking lot that's there, will that still be used until we do further? Or, or maybe you can show that on the map. The, you know, currently we have a little bit of parking by in front of the Civic and, and can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, that, um, I don't know if I have a relevant image for that, but um, you can kind of see it, yes, in this one right above there. Uh, a, a majority of that parking lot is going to be, well, not a majority, but I would say up to 10 spots are being taken by this project. It's also losing its access point. So in essence, this is going to go away. It's also going to go away in the future plaza. Um, what we do have is an additional is the parking lot going in uh, next to City Hall, so that will service some of those needs as well. I believe there's other parking spots that are opening uh, based upon the rental spaces that the city have, uh, as well as things that are going to open in this building. In, and and there's the going to be a concurrent build on this parking lot between the Civic Center and City Hall, so hopefully yes. that'll take that that stuff. Yeah, so it's managed. Uh, okay. I guess that's the point. Mr. Grinberg, you had your hand up? Yeah, I've just maybe a refresher on our process um, when we chose McGow. Um, do we have any other bids that we had? And yes, finance we, committee? Went through a, we went through a selection process. Okay. Okay. We did. And then my so. second question, and who and city staff is oversight? I see there's a $102,000 contingency in this project. Who, um, who is managing this? Is that planning? Is that... Um, uh, right now, we work. We're we're basically working with everyone. We have a project team. Um, that so usually leads to out of control spending, and so who well, is, respons who is, is responsible for the project and making decisions on use of the contingency? Sure, the I can I can um, say that planning certainly is helping to organize this effort right now um, from the day to day, but obviously. Um, the city uh, manager is also, uh, the city administration is also assisting in that. I mean, we're keeping very close look at this. This is a, this is a project that's also managed by myself as the, as the representative. So if you guys have questions, you can always speak to me directly. I'll be in the know. Bruce, are you or Mike involved with this? You oversight? Yeah. Nicole, you want to comment to that? Well, yeah, uh, the, um, the day to day is uh, Megan, Megan Elsheg in our office uh, in conjunction with Tom Knockless in engineering. Uh, myself will be closely involved, but as uh, since it's our own site, our own, um, not your typical construction project, um, we have Brock Morrison, our new facilities manager, as well as uh, um, close coordination with the Civic uh, Center staff and the library staff. But in terms of the day to day, it'd be the planning department uh, coordinating with engineering. Strand. Thank you, Mayor. I, I have a really simple, basic question, and it's more for my curiosity, and I don't want to get too far into the weeds. Sure. But when we have about $30,000 in trees, do we communicate with our own Department of Forestry? Yeah, we're working. And or have them install them? I just want to know how. I mean, that is an option. Um, I think based on the timeline, what we want to do is likely have the construction manager oversee that uh, with a landscaping crew. The, um, the maintenance uh, after that the will we'll definitely look to forestry to make sure that the irrig there's irrigation for the, temp uh, for the temporary tree nursery. Um, and 
I think you need to keep in mind that this is an investment. We're actually installing small caliper trees that will be large caliper trees later on that we can put into the into the plaza. So we're we're trying to um, target species that work very well for transplanting. As well, we're targeting species that will um, grow in a way together so that they limb up higher. Uh, so there is there are things to keep uh, an eye out for, but all of that will go over with forestry, and so they're aware of what we're trying to do in terms of long-term maintenance. Is there any avenue of us purchasing through our forestry department for savings or not? Again, I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but... Um, that's a that's something that we can explore so this is an open a gmp is an open book process so if we take things out that you're going to self-perform then it doesn't go towards that dollar amount um the most that you typically get is a is a tax free right if you purchase any items yourself is scott here today scott isn't here ben can you comment to that So when it comes to tree purchases of this magnitude, usually this has to be done with a bid process early on in the season. So when we're going through and doing a project like this, we're basically um, open to market pricing. You know, you approved tonight on our consent agenda, our tree order for next, for this fall already. And so with that tree order, we're locking those prices up, but this is already too far in play. We would have been bidding these trees this spring to get this quantity and this mass at this time. Mr. Stern. One more question, just to continue on this path. At what point do we discuss the Ten Commandments relative to the plaza? Uh, I, again, I believe that's a, that's a public discussion, and this is not being impacted in this particular project. So, so how close I, will this get to the commandments? I think it's it's up to you guys to have that discussion with the community. Honestly, I'm I'm okay either way. So you could either put it to a vote to see what people want to do. We can talk about different options. But Scott, how how close are we getting physically to? Oh, that, it's um, this project. It's got quite a can, distance. You can John, see it picture. slightly in this image. You mean physically? I'm sorry. Uh, Still, so okay. it's about right. uh, five cars up. There you go, right at the top of that image. Thank you. It will be protected during construction as well, since that will be the logistics area. Well, somebody like the Statue of Liberty you won't disappear on as well, Scott. <laughs> Eric? Yeah. Just a reminder, you know, the uh, City Commission approved an ordinance several years ago now, I think about 12 years ago, saying no statue or other monument that's been in place for 40 years can be removed. Um, so, yeah, we'll have to address it to change your via that via that ordinance it, to the extent that we're moved in some way or another we mm -hmm. probably have to deal with it in the context of that ordinance may i have a motion please so moved. second moved and seconded any further discussion commissioner strand i just want to say how terrific this is you know that this sodbuster this uh, presentation of art to our community are, are propping up uh, the value of art and and creating place you know, so what we're doing here as a commission, and, and it's on the on the heels of, of the previous commission that purchased this art years ago. So, in in a good sense, this is just really awesome what we're what we're doing to our community and and the color and the and the culture that we're enhancing with this. And thanks for everybody for their work on this. Thank you for that comment. And the Plains Art Museum. <coughs> Andy's here. Yeah. Roll call vote, please. Epcorn. Aye. Grinberg. Aye. Gehrig. Yes. Strand. Yes. Mahoney. Aye. Public uh, hearings at this time. Special assessment of nuisance abatement fees. Steve Sprague to explain. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, tonight we have the annual nuisance abatement list. Um, there are a couple of items that I did want to point out. Uh, there's one in there for $32,000, and that was for a, a home that uh, we ended up having removed, and those costs will be added to the list. Uh, the house is ready to come back to the county, and then the county would try to recoup those costs. Um, and then the other comment that I wanted to make was on the Dutch elm disease. Uh, a year ago, we offered the five-year uh, process, and so we had about a half a dozen people that uh, opted to use the five-year assessment rather than the one-year assessment. I don't know if there are any other, any other questions or comments. Does anyone present who wishes to speak to the nuisance abatement fees? Anyone president wishes to speak? 
To close public hearing, do I have a motion? Is there a second? Second. Commissioner uh, Gary. What's the interest rate on the loans for these? Is it a one the one percent above? So no, um, the majority of these are are at uh, a no interest because it's just a one year assessment. The the ones that are five years are at five percent. Is and we got it for four or what's what's the number above our our rate? Is it well, right? we're not bonding for these. Yeah, we're not bonding for so this. Just, so there's just what is what? just assessed like a tax is assessed. Great. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Roll call vote, please. Pepcorn. Aye. Strand. Yes. Gary. Yes. Grinberg. Aye. Mahoney. Aye. Amendments to the 2019 Community Development Block Grant and Home Investment Partnerships Program. Nicole Crutchfield to explain. Yeah, good evening. Um, not too long ago, you approved the action plan and uh, for the CDBG um, 2019 activities. And now that we've further um, investigated or um, further defined our activities, um, we have a few amendments that we are coordinating. And one includes um, uh, working with uh, Beyond Shelter in terms of acquisition as part of the um, Home Field 3 property. And then the other is uh, related to um, a demo project that we conducted as part of uh, uh, 422520, or sorry, um, a demo project that we conducted as well. And so anytime we have a $50,000 uh, or more increase or change, we have to do a public process that includes um, uh, asking if anybody from the public has those comments. So there's an ad been put in place. We have a 30-day comment period. And if everything goes through tonight, you're not in, taking any action tonight, but you would be um, taking action in two weeks. And so um, with that, uh, we would just ask that you open a public hearing to see if anybody has questions related to the um, advertisement. And um, I'm also here to answer any questions, and Tia is here to answer any questions that you might have related to the ad as well. Is there any in the public who wants to speak to the amendments to the Community Development Block Grant? Does anybody present who wishes to speak? I guess nobody wants to speak. So you need no action tonight? No. Close public hearing and wait for the action item in two weeks. Right. Thank you. Item C, continuance, uh, 8 through 2319 Renaissance Zone Project at Great Plains uh, 1001 Holdings, to a new construction project located at 1001 and 1011 North Pacific Avenue North, 28 10th Street North, 10616 First Avenue North, and 1111th Street North, continued from our regular meeting. So it's going to be continued to 82619. Do I have a motion? So, Mr. Chair, can I make a motion and then include items C, D, F, G, and H? They're all to be continued. Can we just make that one motion and then uh, the H as well? H as well. Yep. yep. Second. So H, G, F. C, D, F, G, H. I'm, I make a motion to continue those. Second. So, second. Moved and seconded. Uh, so we have no public discussion. We'll continue it. Roll call vote. Pepcorn. Aye. Grinberg. Aye. Strand. Yes. Gary. Yes. Mahoney. Aye. Item E, Renaissance Zone Project for Valar for a commercial lease project located at 235 Robert Street North. Explanation by Nicole Cutfield. Uh, yes. Good night. We have um, a lease for um, a project that would be located in the Dillard uh, building. Uh, you have a pr already approved this project, um, a DFI Dillard LLC project 262F. And uh, now that that project's nearing completion, we're starting to see lease applications. I think you recently approved one and now we have another one, um, Valor LLC. And so um, with that, we're just seeking your approval um, tonight. Is there anyone present who wishes to speak about this Renaissance Zone lease? Please come to the speaker at that side. Yep. Hi, Mr. Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Luke Robson. I'm the manager of Valaire. Um, and so what we're putting into the 235 Roberts location is a fitness studio. It'll have yoga, cycling, bar, um, intensity circuit courses, stuff like that. Um, it'll just be offering a, a new thing for people to do downtown. Um, we'll be mainly employing college students as well, so we'll be helping out with their college expenses. 
and uh, it will currently employ one full-time um, employee and then with potential to grow two, two or three. So, so if you have any- It's a pretty aggressive plan, isn't it? Sounds like a great place. Let's hope, yeah, that's the that's plan. Thank you. Does anybody else want to speak to this lease? If not, we'll close public hearing. Can I have a motion? Move for approval. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion? Roll call vote, please. Grinberg? Aye. Strand? Yes. Gehrig? No. Pepcorn? Aye. Mahoney? Aye. Item I, uh, zoning change for a limited commercial, multi-dwelling residential portion of lot two, block one, 42nd Street edition. Approval recommended by Planning Commission on 7-2-19, first reading of the rezoning ordinance. Donald Kress to explain. Good evening, Commissioners. Donald Kress with the Department of Planning and Development. Your packet includes a zone change ordinance prepared by the City Attorney's Office. As the Mayor has stated, this is a zone change for a property in the 42nd Street edition. Uh, this is 42nd Street South here, 37th Avenue South. Uh, the property is currently uh, a large apartment building there. As you see, their requested zone change is from limited commercial to MR3, multi-dwelling residential. This is what the property looks like from the street there. These pictures are uh, not from today. They're from a couple weeks ago, but uh, just a view from 42nd Street at the property here, and then on the property looking uh, northeasterly. As you see, the property here is zoned LC, limited commercial. The apartments are there by virtue of a conditional use permit, and that's explained in the staff report. Uh, which is one option, you have a limited commercial zone. The applicant proposes to rezone this to MR3 multi-dwelling residential, which matches the zoning to the north and is uh, an appropriate zoning for apartment buildings. That is my understanding they're going to build an additional building on that open space that they have there. Uh, planning staff has received no calls from neighboring property owners about the project. The applicant's representative, Stacy Holmes, is with us tonight and may wish to address the commission. The Planning Commission's recommendation is stated in your staff report and shown on the screen. That concludes staff's presentation. Commissioners, thank you. Thank you. So anyone president wishes to speak, speak to this rezoning? If you have questions. Okay. Does anybody else want to speak? If not, uh, can I have a motion? Make the recommended motion. Is there a second? Second. Second. Any questions <clears throat> you want to ask her? No? Roll call vote, please. Greenberg? Aye. Gary? Yes. Strand? Yes. Pepcorn? Aye. Mahoney? Aye. Thank you, Commissioners. Item J, application by Aldevron for payment in lieu of tax exemption for the project located in Lot 3, Block 1, Woodhaven Plaza Edition, which is applicant will use through operation and constructing state-of-the-art biologic manufacturing facility to produce therapeutic projects and regents. Mike Redlinger to explain. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Good evening. I'll be handling the pilot items uh, for Jim Gilmore and Ben Hushka this evening. The first item, 35J, is from Aldevron, as the Mayor noted, is for a state-of-the-art biologic manufacturing facility in the Woodhaven addition, and this is going to be for a new 180,000 square foot facility. There's also a companion 20,000 square foot expansion of the existing facility that was built in 2016. Uh, the recommendation is for a payment schedule that's consistent with the previous pilot for the first phase of the project, and that will be a 100% building exemption for the first five years, followed by a 50% exemption for the next five years. Uh, the existing building was granted, again, this identical pilot uh, for five years plus five years in 2016. That pilot is still in place today and will remain so. And uh, the Cass County Commission, uh, I just wanted to note, also approved this uh, pilot application at their recent meeting. Uh, Brian Walters is here on behalf of the company. If there are any questions that the commission would have, uh, the Tax Exempt Review Commission, commission uh, did, in fact, uh, unanimously recommend this action to the commission this evening. Is there anyone present who wishes to speak to this pilot? Anybody wishes to speak? We'll close the public hearing. Do I have a motion? I'll make the motion to approve, and can I just make a couple of quick uh, comments? Uh, for the new positions, 22 from $15 to $20, uh, 25 positions, $20 to $28 an hour, uh, 48 positions, $28 to $35 an hour, and six over $35 an hour. So that is, uh, that is fantastic, and uh, every town in the United States would love to have them. We're very fortunate to have them here. Is there a second? Second. second. Move and second. Any further discussion? 
Joe Strath. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious. It's been in the news that Eldevron might have an ownership change. Will that have any impact at all on this application or of, in any way, shape, or form? Or? Commissioner, uh, Ryan is here and he can answer the question, I think. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, uh, thank you for your consider consideration of our application. And to the short answer is it will have no impact on our application or our project. Is that a rumor or is that seriously happening so many we buy it? Uh, we're, we're, we, there was an announcement recently that another private equity firm bought a stake in our company. A lot of the original owners, of course, are still invested, uh, but, but that transaction hasn't been completed, but we're expecting to by year end. Okay. Any other discussion? Just a comment or two. There's no better example of the intent of primary sector and approval of this application tonight, the expansion of Aldebaran. And in my personal opinion, um, there's no better example of corporate citizen as Elder Efron has leadership have made an impact not only to their employees, but also to the community. And corporate citizenship, corporate citizenship should matter. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Gary? If you didn't get the in incentive, would you still expand? Yeah, you know, I think we look at, at uh, the tax exemption as part of the city's tax policy. And I think in businesses that make investment decisions, um, timing doesn't always work well to to do it on a on a kind of spot notice. So we're deep enough in on the project, and there's enough going on in in our industry segment right now that we need the capacity now. So for this project, truthful answer to your question is that we sort of bake that into our thinking, looking at tax policy. I think that's what businesses do, assuming that if you have a policy and you fit you meet the criteria that that you use that for your projections. But the reality of of uh, I think industry as well is that we would move forward with the project. I think what it would do is for future projects, it would make us look at the tax policy again and see if it fits uh, the company's growth objectives. I think I heard you say you would. So thank you for your honesty. So it's an easy no for everybody. No but for. Mr. Chairman, so it really bothers me when he puts words in people's mouth. Uh, we're in competition. And if you don't think they would be offered a whole lot more to go a lot, well, let me ask Brian, so do you think if you uh, went out and started looking at other cities, you would be offered preferential uh, tax uh, performance things like we were offering? Yeah, it's, I, I, as you know well, uh, it's highly competitive, and, and we've been very pleased with the support that the city of Fargo has grant, given the company over the years that we've operated here. Uh, we've had one exemption previously, as, as uh, Mr. Redlinger referenced, um, and so we appreciate that support. And again, I think it goes more into when you look at tax policy, it's, it's not a short term decision. You have to know the process and know that we're before you asking for your support again. But we're far enough down the, the road with this project where, where yeah, you know, we, we need to build that capacity. We have the land. Um, again, I think what it does for a long range planning is it might give the board interest to, to look at other places because this is going to be very unique to anything built in the world. Uh, shipping material globally, creating jobs locally, and adding to the tax base here. We're, we're hopeful that for your support. And again, thank you for your consideration. Commissioner Gert. I agree with you. The long term is what's important. And that's why people like your company, a good company, grows in Fargo, because we, we strive to have a low, sustainable, predictable type of tax code, where these incentives are the exact opposite of those type of things. They're unpredictable. People don't know if they're going to be there the next year or not. They don't know how much they're going to get. So of course your company would take it. I would never blame your company for taking the incentive or offering it, and it's basically free to you. Um, I don't know a, a person who wouldn't take this deduction off their personal income taxes, for example, if we offered that. So this is a government problem, not a, not a business problem. You have a good business, I'm glad you're growing here. But I think the point is that if we offered a low, sustainable, predictable tax rate, instead of these incentives, we'd have more businesses like you come in and stay here long term. Mr. Chairman, so w one of the things is we're in competition to get these businesses to come here and stay here. And it would be different if, if everyone else was not doing it. But it, if we don't, they're not going to stay. And we're in competition all day, every day to get businesses. And I just told you that the salaries are phenomenal. And to bitch about that, that's just uh, a little bit disingenuous. It sounds really politically, you know, it's easy to make it sound good. But we're in competition. If you don't want to do this, uh, then, then we'll lose businesses. But that, I, that'd be a huge mistake. But. That's, that's the attitude. Thank you. 
Well, Brian, I know that you talked to the ground in 2016 that your company has another plant in Wisconsin as well as somewhere in Germany. And I'm sure you had an opportunity to go elsewhere in the country, but you guys chose to expand here. So that's good for our community. Thank you. Any other discussion? Roll call vote, please. Pepcorn? Aye. Grinberg? Aye. Strand? Gary? No. Tony? Aye. Uh, application filed by TASDEC, uh, Sioux Falls Portfolio for Payment in Lieu of Taxes Exemption on a project located at 122 4th Avenue North, which is application to use in operation of leasing residential apartments and commercial spates. Mike Redlinger to explain. Thank you, Commissioners. The next two items, the next two applications pertain to the Wood Row Wilson apartment project. These items were also considered and recommended for approval by the Taxes and Review Committee at its July meeting. Uh, the Century Code does require that a new application be made for the remainder of a pilot agreement and its term when a new operator takes possession of a project. So that is why these items are before the Commission this evening. So in the case of item 34K, that is the transfer of the agreement for 1222 4th Avenue North, and 34L is the transfer of the agreement for 315 University Drive North. The same terms and conditions as the original pilot apply, and if there's any questions about the statutory requirements, legal requirements, I just defer to the city attorney. Thank you. I'll take K and L together, Mike, since you put them together at this point. Is there anybody present who wishes to speak to these two applications? Is there anyone present who wishes to speak? Close public hearing, do I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve items K and L. Second. Moved and seconded, any discussion? Commissioner Strand. Thank you, um, Mike, Mr. Redling, Redling, Redlinger, is this, it's, it's an ownership change? Yes, in a this case. A new entity? Correct, in the Woodrow case, I defer to Mr. Allmendinger if he'd want to speak to this. Uh, this would be the transfer of the pilot to a new ownership interest. In this case, uh, it is the uh, Zadik uh, group that the reference uh, that the mayor made earlier, uh, Zadik Sioux Falls Portfolio 3 LLC would be the new uh, holder of the pilot after uh, the approval of this action. If I could ask a question about uh, price points and affordability in these apartments, could somebody answer that for me? So, uh, Mike Almendinger with the Kilborn Group. And what, what was your question, Commissioner? Price points. Price points and affordability. I'm, I, I'm always trying to connect uh, tax incentives to affordability for ordinary people. Do we so, have any sense of price points in these apartments and if, if, if so the, they're close uh, to being affordable or not? Um, these two requests are related to the existing Woodrow Wilson building, and it's the it'll be the... Uh, the individuals that are living there now, you know, with at, at the prices that they're living there, will just will remain. So this is a transfer of the ownership, as uh, Mr. Redlinger described. But there's um, so the, the, these this this building is already operating right now. What would be the lowest rent available public price there? I'm not even sure what the lowest rent is right now. Um, I'm, I'm my guess is about. You know, seven, you know, seven fifty or eight fifty, eight hundred fifty dollars a month. For like an efficiency. Yeah, for an efficiency. And Mike, how does that compare with the overall market downtown? Is that pretty competitive, or? Yes. If you look at uh, if you look at other projects in downtown Fargo that have um, that are operating right now, um, it would, it's all competitive with those prices for those other projects. Mr. Chair, so can, can I ask Mike, so obviously the school district owned Woodrow Wilson and it sat there for, I, I don't know if you know the number of years off the top of your head, but uh, it's an example of uh, that made a huge difference to that neighborhood. If you drive there now compared to what, I mean, Woodrow Wilson, John, you were on the, on the school board, that sat there and they were trying to sell it for quite a while. And now if you look at it, it that project has had I mean, you drive down university, there's tons of projects going on all around that neighborhood. And so it's been, uh, that got, got the incentive, but it had positive ramifications for many blocks around. So I want to thank Mike for, for all that he did, because it was a challenge. And, and you've done such a great job of keeping the integrity of the historic school, but also make it a place for, for people to live. And it's, it's an awesome project. So thank you, Mike. 
Yeah, thank you. It, it has been a great project. And again, there's, there's no new terms that are being requested for this transfer. And Eric, just for clarification, all we're doing today is it's a change of ownership and in a pilot that can happen. The commission just has to uh, allow the new owner to take a part of the pilot, is that? That's correct, yep. We're not really revisiting the pilot, what we're just revisiting ownership is just changing, is that correct? Right, yep. For, uh, that's correct, that's for a change of ownership or change of operators, how the staff is. Any other questions, discussions? Commissioner Strand. Thank you. Um, as a new application, is there a new uh, financial evaluation for this, or is it is it just a continuation of the new ownership? Yeah. So there is a new, did back tax exempt do a new financial analysis of this? No, what happens is they adopt the previous pilot that was adopted, so it would go to those previous projections and what was done the first time, John. So you wouldn't you wouldn't redo the pilot, wouldn't really go through tax exempt. It'll just same terms as they had, although you're two years into it now, aren't you? Yes, yes, two years into operating right now. So it doesn't, doesn't so delay so any of that. Five years comes off, they have to pay 50%. And, and if I might continue, Mayor, this is, uh, I, I'm trying to sometimes explain my votes. Um, when I was new to the commission, the Woodrow project came before our commission, and my sense at that point in time was it was a commitment the city had already made with regards to the process and, and the financials. For, for, for the pilots for that project. And, and in that light, I supported what previous, the previous commission had done. That's, as I recall, the only moment I voted for apartments that uh, have uh, pilots attached to them because I, I want to have an affordability component there. But to explain my position, I will, consist, I will stay consistent to my original vote to, to, to support this pilot, which our commission had honored and, and offered to the project developers. I, would, I wouldn't want to disrupt that uh, later on on a moment's notice as a new commissioner. Sure, understood. Any other discussion? Roll call vote, please. Pepcorn? Aye. Grinberg? Aye. Gehrig? Oh. Strand? Yes. Mahoney? Aye. Items M, I guess we could go the same way. M, N, O, and P? Yep. Is that for you, Tom? Uh, Mike, you want to explain? I'd be happy to, Commissioners. These are four applications pertaining to the Block 9 project, the overall project. Um, a series of new entities are being created to ultimately own the assets and different elements of the project. And the Tax Exempt Review Committee also took this up at its July meeting and approved and recommended all four of, of these transfers as well. So consistent with the previous item, the Century Code in this case also does require a new application to be filed for the remainder of the existing pilot agreements in this case. So 35M is the transfer of the hotel portion of 215 Broadway from the Block 9 LLC to DFI Block 9 Hotel LLC. And I would just note in all four of these transfers, uh, the terms are consistent with a payment schedule that was granted and approved by the City Commission on May 23 of 2016. 35N is a transfer of the RDO corporate headquarters portion <laughs> of the project uh, from Block 9 LLC to Block 9 RDO LLC. Uh, 35O is a transfer of the retail portion of 215 Broadway from Block 9 LLC to DFI Block 9 retail LLC. And 35P is a transfer of the office portion of 215 Broadway from Block 9 LLC to Block 9 SRO LLC. And again, all terms are consistent with previous commission action on May 23 of 16. And uh, happy to answer any questions, Eric Johnson as well, on any of the legal questions related to the Block 9 transfers. Thank you. Is there anyone present who wishes to speak to this application? Anyone on to Discuss this in public. If not, we'll close public hearings. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion. If it's okay, we'll combine them all again, M, N, O, and P. But then I, I, I also have a question. So is this similar to what we just talked about, Mike? We're basically, it's just, it's still the same agreement, but we're just dividing it up into the different entities now because of the, 
the, the way it's set up. Can you talk a little bit about that? That is correct. And there's actually a letter in your packet uh, this evening from the RDO tax analyst that's providing an overview of, of why we're now creating these separate shells and entities to, the, to own the eventual assets of the project. But yes, it is consistent with that previous action. The pilot terms as approved by commission continue in full force and effect. No new terms are suggested or proposed here. Is there a second? Second. Moved and second. Any discussion? Mr. Strand. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> this stuff gets complicated, complicated, and I, you know, I'm, as I recall, when in May of 2016, when this was voted on by the commission, our policies at that point didn't quite necessarily reflect what they voted on um, with regards to some of the aspects of the pilot and some of the uses of in, in Block 9. Um, but then subsequent to that, our our, our tax exempt review commission and our city commission changed those policies so that in retrospect they would, if they were to apply later, would qualify. Um, so originally I wasn't in favor of some aspects of those pilots and, and, and at that time I would not have voted for some aspects of those pilots relative to the existing policy. Now, years later, I'm not inclined to debate the pilots um, if, if there's any chance of uh, us putting the project at risk. I just can't imagine us having a project that has been, life has been breathed into it by uh, all these government subdivisions and investors, and then later on have a, a, a hiccup where we might have a political change of, will, of appetite in our commission, and somebody decide, well, we're, we're no longer doing this, and then we've got this building out there that's under construction. So where I'm at is we need to honor the Commission's previous decisions. Whether or not there's elements of those decisions we would have back then disagreed with. I'm talking me personally. So yes, I would have disagreed with elements of those decisions back in 2016 relative to the existing policy for pilots. But that said, I can't fathom that we would upturn that right now and, and upset that apple cart right now. I just can't imagine that that would be on something I would participate in doing, but I wouldn't want to not register my, my concerns about some of the applications and, and uses of pilots back when those policies were what they were then. Any other discussion? Roll call vote, please. Pepcorn? Aye. Grinberg? Aye. Gehrig? No. Strand? Yes. Mahoney? Aye. We'll take a five minute break and come back at six o'clock and we'll talk about the budget. Thank you. We'll call a meeting back to order. I'll let Mr. Pepcorn get back to his chair. He's probably going to go to that fitness center downtown now. So. What do you say in a month? So this is the preliminary budget. We did have a brown bag uh, on this before. And now we're going <clears throat> to kind of go over what to happen. So two and a half weeks ago, we did the preliminary budget. Tonight I'm asking for approval of preliminary budget will set the cap on the mills and to schedule a public hearing date for the preliminary budget. I think it's important to acknowledge the process went into the development of the preliminary budget and that we had department meetings with all our departments from May to June. The budget team worked on the draft of the budget initially from June to July and that presentation was done. We've had commissioner input for the preliminary draft and I appreciate all of you coming in and talking with different staff and different ideas. Uh, and now we have final completion and you will see some changes as we go through there. So I'll just uh, try to point those out as I go through. Again, growth and demand of city services in a 10 year history. We have that growth, we know that. Uh, we had five areas of, uh, of which we talked about that are important. We believe it's imperative to improve the levels of service our residents expect, perhaps uh, continuing implementation of the police department's strategic plan and responding to emergent issues. Police Department is partnering with our library and math bus departments to provide an officer to focus attention on the security needs of these areas. We've had complaints in these areas and we want to address them in a more efficient manner. We also feel that there's more efficiency of our police and city departments as they're doing things. And the uh, police chief has a plan as far as the downtown security and safety that goes forward with the addition of his staff. 
Also, Ben Dow's got the task of looking into snow gates. You asked for it. We heard from our, our citizens. They want us to look into snow gates, so we'll look into snow gates and or any other methodology to try to figure that out in the winter time. And as we all know as commissioners, it was a terrible winter anyway, but if we can try to figure out some of those things, it'd be helpful to our community. In planning and community development, we're really excited about that. We're going to focus on outreach and community involvement. We're going to do a core neighborhood plan and a LDC update. And I think it's a huge task for our planning department, but it's going to be welcomed in our community to have a focus of where we're headed in the future and how should we achieve our goals. In transit efficiencies, we have redirected resources after evaluating the Link FM performance. We will utilize Link FM services for targeted events. I'm proposing a suspension of the daily service, and instead of using resources, help the fund a collaborative project with United Way to provide workforce transportation services to the industrial park. The commission then will re-review that in six months to, to 12 months and see how well it works. <coughs> also, we're gonna do a paratransit pilot where we use a part-time non-benefited staff member to serve as a personal care attendant to increase efficiency and improve customer services experiences. It's important for our people that they have that type of experience in a good, goodly manner. And the other aspect we've gone into inspection zones. As our geographic footprint grows, we need to create inspection zones across the city. It should improve turnaround time, offering faster services to the public with increased staff and new technology. We feel our inspectors will be giving better service to the community and that contractors should like that. Now, as we went through things, we talked about the underfund budget priorities and the different uh, impacts that are going on in our city. And this is the thing that commissioners are very aware of, of what's happening. Uh, one thing in public safety, which we're really excited about for the first time in a long time, every open position is now filled in the police department. With the new police positions being recommended in the draft preliminary budget, we're keeping pace with the PD strategic plan. The commission feels that this is very important and we need to keep it going. City staff, we can't lose sight that we're competing for employments outside the public safety as well and have to keep our, mark, our, our wages competitive. The wage adjustment, we just caught up with the market, now we have to keep it up. In the draft preliminary budget, I'm proposing a 2.5 competitive wage adjustment for 2020. And the, the commission also recently approved the bus driver contract. And again, in order to keep bus drivers, we have uh, Marvin did a great job, but we've got to keep our bus drivers out there doing great work for our public. Also, <clears throat> we've had a significant request for food employees. 43.95 were requested. We only approved six. We also have a 15% increase in health insurance premiums. And as you know, we've made a commitment to the metro area for the community class K County Land Trust, trying to find affordable housing and new methodology of doing this. Also on fueling our future of workforce analysis and how we can increase workforce in our community. This has been a long-term goal of our community and we feel these initiatives are very, for, are, are very important for that to go forward. And also with continued growth of the city, we have to increase our growth in operating service levels. As you know, there are major categories in budgetary expenses, and those are personnel expenses, operating expenses, and capital expenses. We've worked very hard in all three of these categories to keep our costs down. So in evaluation for criteria for personnel request, as you know, we set up a new criteria in which we could go through this, and utilizing these six different methodologies of when a request was made, we tried to rate the different people that were requested and see if they met the criteria in these areas. I've gone over this before for you, and I think you understand it, but it's a new matrix that you can look at when you try to evaluate, do you need a new personnel in, in what department? I know all of my department heads did not get everything they wanted, but this was a very tough year to try to figure this out. I think we were fair in how we set up the process and looked at every position very hard. So in general fund, what people had requested is 43.95 uh, positions, and we have found needs for uh, six of those positions. The focus was on direct line service employees, public safety and public works employees. We opted to approve two for streets and respond to growth in service areas. We recommended to approve four police officers. Street level positions were the priorities, priorities that staff members had the greatest need. In the non-general fund, and this is utility funds that are funding this, is growth with our utilities, water, wastewater, and our community is growing in those areas. We need people to uh, make sure our water is safe. So our utilities and regional partnerships are growing. 
The good news is that the long-term uh, utility financial plan models did account for these new positions. And wastewater plumbing inspector was the highest rated to serve inspection needs of both engineering and building inspections. We feel the positions added in this area do help with our enterprise and providing services throughout the community. Also in planning, we're pleased to add another planner in the areas that we need, especially in community areas, community grant areas, and the HUD home grant. We feel that we can continue to work to find affordable housing and see if there's other ways in which we can enhance our community. Operating expenses. Initially in their operating expenses, there was a request uh, for, uh, this is an uh, increase in operating expenses, not what, but ad additional, 2.6 million. And we went through this list and basically parted it down to 1.3 We kept working on this and we went back to the different department heads and I said, are there some funds that you're not utilizing? And we found we could find an additional savings in some of the funds that weren't utilized. And by doing this, the operating expense uh, has come down to uh, 145000 So this is a, a tremendously decrease in the new funding that we will need in this area. And uh, I think it's fairly important when we look at this. In the three-year look back, that's why we found some of this money that was present in that area. So in operating expenses, we basically have a 6% increase in funding, which I think is a, a tremendous uh, way of keeping those costs down. In capital expenses, uh, general fund 101, the operating, this is typical operating related capital uh, the quest was $1.7 million and $639,000 is in our draft that presents. Last year was $636,000, so I think we've kept consistent with the general fund capital needs. In capital equipment fund 475, again, we get into the same area as a special account for some of our larger capital items, including equipment and vehicles. Revenue sources of capital current are utility transfer, primary water and wastewater. Uh, it was about a million dollars higher in 2019. Is one is that we're getting a new fire truck, pumper truck, and equipment, which is 650,000. In IS and electronics, we have in communication and video equipment for police and fire in card video system. That's 150,000. And then public works is working on security and drainment and, and uh, drainage for improvement on our storage site. So that's going to help to improve that as well. Uh, Commissioner Strano one time asked uh, capital growth, what are we going to do in the future and where are we going to look in a building fund? And this is usually bonding, bonding projects. So uh, this is just a rough idea of the needs of the city, Merchantile Ramp, Civic Plaza, Transit Capital Grant Equipment. Just going forward where some capital costs may come and we usually would look for bonding in many of these areas. And so we just want to make again the commissioners aware uh, going forward what, what we may need. Part of the revenue for this depth service also could come from the South City owned property, Mid America Steel, Old Police Building, Old Public Health Building, Park East Property. If the proceeds from the city owned land sales were placed into debt service capital fund, it's a way of addressing some of the debt service uh, uh, payments. So, what's changed is we put everything together, and what I tried to have Ken Costin do is put what is in the 19 budget and what is in the 20 budget. Because, as you know, we made some salary changes in the, in the uh, 19 budget. And that does impact. So what you'll see in comparison to the last one is that we have an increased amount in the revised budget of 219, which goes to 101,235,000. So what we tried to do is this budget is, is, has the current levels of spend and most carried forward in the 2020 budget. So examples would be the public safety compensation increases as well as the transit driver pay. And with changing that, then that really ch changes uh, the number from the 98 to actually 101. Also in the 2020 request is actually request 101, uh, 111 million, and our proposal is 103 million. So all in all, when you see the changes from last year to this year, it's an increase to our revised budget of 1.8 million, and it's a 1.9 change. And I think that's fiscally sound to keep it in, in that range. Uh, we have not had a, a huge change, but we do have things that are going on within our city, and this reflects the, the changes that we need to address. But I do think from before to this one, you will see we've had a couple changes in, uh, in the budget as far as it was 101 to 103. 
So let's look at revenue. So in revenue, what we requested is a two mill property increase. And for a $260,000 home or $250,000 home, that's $21 a year. I know West Fargo announced their mill levy change today and they compared it to a $100,000 home. And ours is only eight fifty-five dollars for a $100,000 home. There's be an increase to landfill of the dumping cost and basically that does not apply to residential and no curbside increases. There's an increase to residential curbside recycling fees and that's a dollar a month. And just uh, there was a story in, in the TV about this. It really is because recycling uh, in China is not as much as it used to be. It's not that all our garbage they take, but the recycling parts of that are, are difficulty for us. So that's more of the comment. I just want to go over a mill levy and historical review is when we look at this since 2012, we have gone down 7.2 fine mill reduction. So for some people that don't recognize that that indeed has happened. Our levy that we could go up to is 64 mills and we've never, or nor do we want to go to that level, but the city has the ability if it needed to go that high, it could go that high. A two mill uh, in increase is uh, just a, a modest increase at this point. We're still less than the uh, 7.5, we're only 5.25 reduction over since 212. And the two mill is needed for a community that's growing, the city that, uh, services that we want to provide. General fund revenue projections, when we go into this, there's some changes as well I want you to note. It's just where our revenue is coming to. So uh, property taxes is 2.9 million more, and it's an increase of two mil rate will give us approximately $1,126,000, plus an overall growth of the tax base that produces 1.7 million in new resources. The tax base increased by 6.4 this year in line with long-term tax base growth rate, and the current rate increase was 2.9 in new construction and 3.5 in market valuations. This is a modest increase and this has stayed at a lower amount than we have had in the last several years. License and permits, uh, we feel there'll be decline in uh, multifamily construction. Building permits for apartments current year have declined significantly. No permits have been issued this year for apartment construction. We anticipate that may well carry over through 2020. What we didn't have in license and permits is wastewater. We'll have some construction next year, which will bring some permitting fees back up. Also in the shared revenue sharing uh, double digits as compared to previous years is the state revenue. Our revenue assumption for state age predicted at 6.7 increase. The so statewide growth rate for sales tax recently was reported in increasing by 10%. The state trend has changed from a significant decline to a strong increase the past several quarters signifying recovery in the past years. And at present time, the city of Fargo may have a sales tax increase of one to 2%, which in the past we've been going down. So we do feel that we, state revenue should increase to about 700,000. Our fines also during legislative changes, the fines can be increased for traffic violations effective August 1st, 2019. And this budget does assume that Chief Todd will bring back to us a new uh, fine schedule for that. And we will be increasing our fines for traffic violations. And I think you as commission know that it's gonna be coming forth to you. When we look again at revenue, then our revised budget for 2000 is 103 is where we have it sitting at. And again, that's a modest change at 2.7%. The next steps of the 2020 budget is that we received, approved and filed a preliminary budget. And then we set a public hearing date of, uh, that will be on September 9th. Uh, you've seen some moderate revisions of the budget tonight and we can both clarify it when you get your uh, uh, handouts in regards to this as well. What it means to the public is that we can't go up in our mail levy. You can go down if you find some cost savings in the budget. So finally, uh, what do we want as a commission and as a city? Safe city for everybody. We've made that commitment and we continue to make that commitment to our constituents. We are a regional leader, not only nationally, but statewide as well. We have smart growth going on in the community. I think our planning department has been tasked to try to figure out which way we need to go in those areas. We involve uh, community engagement. We want the public involved in our budget and involved in our uh, city government as well. Uh, any things they want to go forward. We had a great discussion today, bike pass, no bike pass, what should we do, what does the city want, where should we go? And we're also nationally recognized for service excellence. And again, our city employees, we should be very proud of. They do a great job every day providing a service to our community. And I think we can be proud as a commission for the service we give. We're ranked sixth nationally as far as the service you give. 
and I challenge any of you when you travel not to find any better service than we get the city of Fargo. So the uh, suggested motion is approve the 2020 preliminary budget and set a public hearing date for September 9, 2019 at 6 p.m. I request a motion to approve. I'll make the motion. Is there a second? <clears throat> second. Any discussion? Question. Mr. Renberg. Um, I think in the prelimin preliminary slides we went through at the brown bag, you had a slide or two on reserves. Can you comment um, where we're at? We're not using any reserves for this budget, correct? Actually, thank you, Commissioner Grinberg. I'm not using any, we're not using any reserves at this time in this budget, and we have for the last three years. And actually, uh, Commissioner Gehring had pointed out last time, we are now dropping our reserves to below 30%. We're going to be somewhere between 25 and 28% as far as when you look at it in comparison to the budget. So uh, our, our reserve, this is 18, and it goes down again uh, in 19, and it'll be roughly around 27%. There's no ordinance that says we stay at 25%. That's just been good policy that in reserves we carry 25%. So I think we're getting close to that mark and best not touch it if we can. Thank you for asking that. Any other discussion? Mr. Gary. Thanks, Mayor. Um, so as far as looking at the two mil uh, increase, so ways that we can reduce the budget uh, that don't affect our services that will not then require us to not only add two mils, but I, to just reduce uh, one mil in fact, two very simple things. One cut the art and social services fund. It's a one mil that we take from the people of Fargo and we get to be charitable with it. We give it to the charity that we choose rather than allow people to use you know, their dollars to get whatever charity they want to do. The other thing we can do is look at the COLA. Uh, right now you're offering a 2.5 across the board. Last year I offered that we do something a little bit more creative, zero to five, zero to five years, five to 15 years, and then 15 years plus of service. If we do a three two zero policy on that, we would save the residents of about a million dollars. If we do those two things, we would not have to reduce any mills and we would be able to actually reduce a mill. Additionally, with the police, fire, and bus drivers, I think we should be, we should offer a different call than what you're offering as well, considering that we went through the process of seeing what their pay is, trying to make them competitive, and we all agreed that the amount that we gave them was competitive, we voted on that, and it passed. So we, we addressed those three areas already this year, adding a call on top of that, I think uh, is counter to what we said that we were doing before, and that is bringing them to market. Um, let's see. With the mills, if we do nothing but as far as adding or subtracting mills, uh, we bring in 6.4 or something close, over 6% in additional revenue through property taxes. That's a, that's a tremendous jump for any city to get that much growth in, in one single year. Part of that is valuations, part of that is new buildings, comes together to be over 6%. What we're telling people of Fargo is, is that that's not enough. In one year, we want to go from your from the amount you're paying last year to over 11% the next year. 11% in one year in one area to increase that amount that they're taking in is a tremendous amount. So going forward, I hope that we can work as a commission to be a little bit more creative in, in just these two simple areas, and that way we don't have to reduce anyone's property. We have to increase anyone's property taxes. Um, so that's just a comment I want to make uh, going into this discussion. And probably today what we would do is uh, approve the preliminary budget and the debate you want to have with Commissioner Garing would be in the, when we try to approve it as a final budget. So I, I could leave you to continue to develop that thought and see what you come up with for the commissioners. Any other discussion? Roll call vote, please. Or Commissioner Stern. Chime in before we just I'm Something like 71, 72% of our entire budget is our people, is, is our wages, our compensation, and our benefits plans. And I, I believe, and I want the community, I think it's important we all remember that this last year, these last few years, we've become aware that we've lagged behind with our people relative to their opportunities in other cities and other jobs. So that was just critical. If, if we had to, no choice, in my opinion, to, but to address fire uh, wages in our police department. We just had to. And, and, we, and we had to do it with our buses, uh, our bus drivers out there. If we didn't, we would be have, people would just be clamoring at our doors saying that we're negligent in, in doing our basic work. So I'm, 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 I'm as cautious as anybody out there about any increases at all. But I'm also, uh, 
valuing the, the leverage changes and improvements we need to make. We need to invest in our people. We need to invest in public safety. And, and I, I believe the community is expecting this of us. So this two mil increase, we're going back to the 2017 level. Um, it's not the end of the world, it's not ideal, but it could be a lot worse. And what we're going to be delivering will be significantly better and, and stable. And we're, we're gonna keep our people, and we're not gonna have as much turnover. We're, we're, th this is just really important basic stuff in any business and in any city. So it's, it's gonna be a, an, an, you know, it's gonna take some, it's gonna extract more from people's pocketbooks, but we're going to be delivering a lot more. Well, to your point, Commissioner Strand, uh, police officers sometimes spend six months on the force before they can really go out on their own. So the chief is with a, a veteran a police officer at the time. And it's horrible if you lose a guy at six months because you've just trained them up and got them ready for doing their duty and they're not doing it. And part of the reason we have the safety in the streets is we want our guys well trained when they're out in the field. And we attempt to do that in every way. So just to your point, our water operator, you know, if that guy doesn't do it right, then we have trouble with our water. I tell Troy the water smells funny, but I mean, we've got all these automatic computer things when you go over that water plant, it's fantastic, but you've got to have somebody at, at the dial to try to make sure everything's right. So I appreciate that. Any other comments? I would just add as well, I mean, it's a delicate balance over, if you look at the past years and the data and Commissioner Gehrig's point about other ways to reduce spending, but when you look at the track record, um, the mill levy's been reduced time and time after again. Um, as well as valuation increases, which creates more revenue for the city. And then the balance is how do you, you know, appropriate those dollars for the needs of the city? And Chief Todd and I had a series of email exchanges. Um, what's important to me on this process is that we're delivering on his 10-year plan. And the data um, that he has tracked and provided me gives me confidence that we are moving forward with a budget that is meeting his needs as a 10-year plan as the head of our police department, because the public is expecting us to create and sustain a, a safe community. And so when you look at the overall employee growth, it's in police. And then we look at the, the discussion and debate about compensation, COLAs, and mid-year adjustments. Um, the point is, I believe we have a budget now that we're not gonna have to have that discussion mid-next year, I hope. Uh, so we prepared for that. And so as equally, you can't continue to spend reserves and um, so this is, a, I think, a happy medium to get us to where we need to be. And then the future should be based on what's our growth projection uh, to move forward to balance budgets. Gary. There's just one bit of information I want to pass on to the public, too. And um, in 2018, we created what's called Fund uh, 475. That used to be in the general fund budget. It used to be funded through the general fund. We took that cost out, which was not a small cost. Back then, it was $3.7 and the funding source out of the general fund, then we said we reduce the general fund. Okay, that, that's a, it's technically true, but the amount that we we're paying and the funding source was just called something else now. In 2019, we moved engine, uh, the personnel for the streetlights out of the general fund and moved it into a different fund by itself. Again, reducing general fund, but that funding source went with it, okay? If we were to put those two things back in today, in the 2020 preliminary budget, it would be $108 million. So what we're saying is our budget is 101, 103 million dollars. But if you were to ignore the fact that we just moved those accounts over and just change the names of them and put them back in, our general fund budget is now 108 million dollars. That is a dramatic increase over the 2017 budget of 95 million dollars. So while I think that we like to say that we're being very responsible tax dollars and our budget only went up by two percent, that's simply not true. We just moved the accounts and called them something else, but we also moved the funding sources over. So I want an honest discussion what we're actually spending here and how much we've increased spending over the last only three years. And that, that increased amount, if I do my math on this sheet here, is around 13%. And that's pretty dramatic. That's, that's a lot of increase in three years. And that's not something I'm very proud of as a commissioner. So when I ask for small decreases and not increases in the mills, I think that's part of the, 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 part of the story, part of the narrative to say, hey, we have increased a lot of things. We're doing really good as a city. We've got great services. We're hiring more police and fire. We're doing a lot of good things here. But at the end of the day, people are feeling crushed by property taxes, by special assessments, and, and growing a lot of government around them. And I think you've seen the frustration in a lot of these, people, a lot of these discussions we've had. Uh, so we need to not only be good to our employees, which I think we have been this year with, with the increase in police and fire and the bus drivers, which I, which I agree needed to happen. No one's saying that we don't value those people. But at the same time, those dollars are coming from somewhere, and an 11.3% increase in property taxes, I think a lot of people are not gonna like that. 
So what happened several years ago, the commission got a little frustrated with bouncing around and what would happen is capital requests would come in and when the capital requests would come in, the general fund funding would go up higher and you still have to have utility transfers in to cover the costs. Commissioners asked us to straighten it out and make it a little bit more simple. So to try to have the general fund consistently fund certain items every year. So you as commissioners could kind of see what's the change in growth and development in the group. Because if you throw one big capital uh, purchase in there or several capital purchases in there, it will bounce your general fund up, but you're going to get a transfer in from utility. So that's why we have the different general fund funds now to help the commissioners see easier what's been going on and what's changed since last year. That was specifically a request basically for the commission because otherwise you have this bounce effect on your budget and you're not really paving apples to apples. What has changed over the last year? What are we doing in buildings and ground? What's going on in engineering? What's going on in different departments? So it was really an attempt to try to get some consistency in that. And what the commissioners have now I feel is consistent. Every year now it'll track the same way that you presently see in the budget. Sitting down with Kent and Bruce Grubb, we felt this was a better way to show you the business of what's going on. So it, it takes out that nebulous of utility transfers come in there, and that's really not general fund money, that's usually utility transfers. So that's what we're attempting to do with this budget. We show you a budget for the general fund, 103 million, that's what we have in revenue, here's what pays for things we have to pay for. Trying to keep it consistent so the public as well can understand where we spend the money. And uh, it, that can be clarified further with any of the commissioners they want to visit with Bruce or with Kent. But that's why we did it. And, and, and actually, Commissioner Garrick, you requested that at one time as well, is to try to get rid of this bounce effect. So that's what we attempted to do. With well, that, we'll do a roll call. One last Render. question. I don't know who's running the slides, but I know in the brown bag presentation, you had a slide that showed three or four year analysis of a quarter million dollar home and what the tax was four or five years ago and what it is with this proposal. Yep, I'll get there and just, let's go get to it quicker. Here we, here we go. That's the one you want? Wasn't there one with a specific house that has an example that showed that basically the city tax is about the same? That one? Greg, am I missing one or? That's it. This one. Maybe it's this one, okay. Yes. I think it's important to, to remember that. Thank you. Roll call vote, please. Pepcorn? Aye. Grinberg? Aye. Strand? Yes. Gehrig? Mahoney? Aye. Is there any other business to the commission? Move to adjourn? That's a move. All in favor Second. say aye. Aye. You're adjourned, thank you.